if you look, if you will, at uh, old school organizational structures, they are very hierarchical. And the concept is that there is this uh, awesome, extremely smart guy who is the CEO. Then, you know, there is his leadership team and, you know, he directs his leadership team. Then they direct, you know, the next layer uh, level down. And then there's a bunch of minions who actually do stuff. You know, maybe that worked in an industrial era, but it's no longer applicable, right? Because for any successful business these days, you have to have so many bright minds doing so many different things and uh, for any smart person you know what if you're any good at what you do you can find any kind of job out there right so you will not want to work in an organization where they just basically tell you what to do the best way to really leverage uh, capabilities of any person is to have them as fully engaged in the organization as possible right so that means uh, they should be able to provide the input and uh, direction and be uh, self-directed as much as possible in what they do let's go i sell products not advertising this monkey business is in your blood under your skin you're getting out you're just getting in you're only getting started people will think what i tell them to think oh have i got your attention now you have part of my attention you have the minimum amount this guy's got the right idea why don't we begin locked and ready bombs away Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? What is happening? How are you? I am Mitch Fanning. I am your host. This is my podcast. Welcome to it. For those listening for the first time in this podcast, I cover a variety of subjects, including business, marketing, and personal growth. Today, I sit down with my friend and serial tech entrepreneur, Dimitri Buterin. Now, for those of you not familiar with Dimitri, he's built three, count them, three multi-million dollar businesses, including Wild Apricot, a leading membership management software company that he grew from zero to $10 million before it was acquired in late 2017. He's also an angel investor and advisor to several tech and blockchain businesses, one being Block Geeks, an online resource for anyone who's interested in learning how to become a blockchain developer. And speaking of blockchain, Dimitri also happens to be the proud father of Vitalik Buterin, the creator of Ethereum, which as of this recording had a market cap of $48 billion, which makes it the second most valuable crypto network next to Bitcoin. But to be honest, what impresses me the most about Dimitri is actually his down to earth and humble demeanor. We also both happen to share an interest in personal growth and ironically, both took a sabbatical around the same time with mine just ending and his still continuing. And whenever we reconnect, I always seem to learn something new, and this time was no exception. As usual, during the conversation, we cover a variety of topics, including sabbaticals, personal growth, parenting, entrepreneurship, and of course, blockchain. Obviously, I can't say enough about Dimitri. He's definitely one of the good guys. So without further ado, let's get into it. Dimitri, thanks again. We usually... uh meet for lunch when we get a chance to, but I thought it would be interesting just to sit down with you and kind of, you know, have this kind of format, you know, when you, when you sit down with people, you know, that are interesting and and have done some stuff when you're having lunch, you don't get a chance to ask them these type of questions. So I thought it would just be, uh, it'd be, it'd be neat to sit down. So again, thanks a lot. And what's your former company wild apricot so it's 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 cool to be actually in in the environment that where it kind of all took place right on so just to paint a picture here now according to your your personal website you're you're on sabbatical you're you're on a break you're not kind of actively taking time to to get into something kind of a project now i know you're kind of you're working with block geeks and you're kind of informally doing some advising, but how's that going? Yeah. Yeah. That's totally right. I'm not actively running the business for the first time. And I guess, uh, in my whole working career in life for the last 25 years or so. And, uh, yeah, I'm on my sabbatical and uh, doing exactly what you have described. So it's more of our internal journey, exploring myself, traveling, doing all kinds of new kinds of learning. So why did, why was it the right time to kind of exit the business and to do this? Have you, have you thought about it? Yeah. And there are many answers to that. And, uh, 
one of them is like because it ha- it happened, then it's the right time, right? And uh, another answer is that I actually was not sure. Uh, and uh, one thing that gave me a lot of clarity last summer, I went to this uh, uh, very powerful retreat um, in Ireland, uh, a week long retreat, and uh, I was still at the time not quite sure. You know, I wasn't the fence about selling the business and some other stuff, and. Uh, that retreat uh, brought me a lot of clarity on the personal front as well as on the business front. And I came back uh, very uh, confident that this is the right time for me to move on uh, from the business. And uh, I have been able to deal with a lot of fears I had around that and uh, just made a decision. And and then it, as always, took much longer than I hoped, but then eventually it happened. Right. So... Do you mind talking about like what the retreat was like a little bit? Sure. Uh, people who know me, they know that uh, all of my life I've been uh, very passionate about personal development yes. and been doing all kinds of things in that sphere. From initially, it was all about books. I love reading, so I read a lot of books. And I guess one of my early books uh, it was a book by Tony Robbins when I was maybe twenty-five. And then I've done a lot of different conferences, events, and uh, in the last five years also been exploring uh, more and more, working with different kind of coaches and mentors and uh, facilitators, if you will. And this person, his name is Philip McKern, and I've done a bunch of stuff with him here and there. And his signature event is called Brave Soul, which he does once a year in Ireland. He's Irish, but now lives in the U.S., and... uh, uh, it's a very powerful event. Um, my wife, Maya, went to this uh, retreat a year before me, and I went to this a year ago. And this year, there was a bunch of people there that I recommended them to go. And, uh, yeah, it uh, made a big impact on them as well. And the retreat is, uh, how to put this, he creates an environment uh, which helps people achieve a lot of clarity and understanding of themselves and why are they doing things or not doing things. Uh, and business and then personal life and so on. So what's the, is it like, I'm, I'm assuming you had to travel. So um, was it like multi-day? Yeah, it was uh, the whole week. And okay. uh, it was in Ireland, basically some uh, small village uh, somewhere in Ireland. And he facilitates the whole experience. So he puts people into these little cottages and this rural little village in Ireland. And um, then he uh, orchestrates the whole experience. Like, you know, it might be hike one day. It might be uh, some other stuff. Then he gives people uh, the ner- very insightful questions. And then he gives them time to actually sit down and uh, process those questions and really try to find those answers. And uh, uh, one of the requirements that people go totally offline Mm-hmm. You know, don't use any devices, don't phone home, because it takes a few days for people to disconnect, you know, from all their noise and all the stuff that's going on in their lives. So really the idea is to how to help people connect with themselves, like, you know, when they're not so attached to all the different things going on in their lives. No, absolutely. Now you mentioned hike, uh, and one of the things like, I've realized in my life is that the best moments weren't in front of a screen. And I've started just like you, uh, cause I, you know, like I was saying before we, we started that I'm also, I also took a sabbatical and a break. And one of the things I've realized about myself is that, uh, one of my favorite movies was Indiana Jones, kind of how he went on these adventures and kind of how he, he had, uh, you know, a professional life. He did, he did things kind of in the professional world, but then he, every once in a while, he threw on his hat and his, his whip and he went off and he did adventures. And I felt like that's something that I actually want to have more in my life. So I'm starting to structure that. What are some of the kind of insights? Cause you mentioned you had some insights. What were some of the, if you're willing to share any of them, what were some of the insights that you took from that? Um, the biggest realization was that, uh, the reason that uh, I was still on the fence about selling the business is because I had a lot of fears around that. And uh, 
and in general, you know, in life, uh, most of the stuff stuff we do is really out of fear, not out of, uh, if you will, love. And that's uh, the biggest uh, uh, weakness of so much of our decisions and uh, uh, developments in our lives. So I, I realized that, oh, yeah, I have this fear. Uh, what's going to happen to all the people in the business and how will I be able to deal with their emotions, uh, their emotions, and then my emotions relate to their emotions. Then it was also fear about money. Oh, if I sell now, but the business is really on the upswing, is doing really well. Actually, this year is doing awesome. Um, should I sell now? What if, what if I miss out on this, right? Um, but yeah, once I realized that, and when I connected what was deep inside of me, I realized that, you know what, it's been a really good run. I've been running that business for 12 years, and it's uh, been amazing. But I realized that my personal journey has been unfolding in a certain direction, and uh, uh, the business was no longer fully aligned with uh, where I'm going. And uh, it's time for me to take a break and uh, uh, and go into a slightly different direction. Okay. So how did you, how have you, you know, once you kind of got over that, how did, how have you approached the sabbatical? Have you kind of had some structure or has it been more open-ended? Yeah. Um, very open-ended because, uh, one of the realizations for me in the last few years has been that, uh, all in all, I'm very analytical and structured about things in my life and very disciplined and all that stuff. And all of that has been uh, tremendous and uh, getting me where I am. But I am a big believer in the concept that uh, your biggest uh, strengths, they also become your biggest weaknesses. Because uh, once you have a certain way of doing things, then uh, it's like a hammer. Everything around you looks like a nail and you just hammer those nails. But uh, um, I know that actually... I wanted to have some more flexibility in the different approaches that I, you know, take to different things. Like, for example, when I started meditation, I was very tempted to use this very analytical, methodical approach and, like, use those devices like Muse and blah, blah, blah. But then I realized that, oh, you know what? Actually, for my analytical brain, it's much better to do it differently, much more um, in a different way, you know, not so rigid and disciplined and analytical and still disciplined in some way like i do it daily but uh, uh, again not using my logical analytical brain so much and uh, the same was my sabbatical so when i was thinking about this and i also had a huge temptation to once i left wild apricot to jump into another business that i was working on last year but and then in december i made the decision that you know what no it's time for me to take a break and uh uh, totally open-ended like you know now i'm uh, uh transitioning out of wild apricot and i was able to do this very quickly um we sold the business by end of september and by end of the year i was out of the business and i said yeah no it's uh it will happen and i planned some trips but i did not plan much after that and uh one thing people keep asking me this year is like oh are you looking for a new business and uh something to do and I'm not and all kinds of projects actually come in my way and I look at them and like no they don't resonate with me and some things started to resonate with me but uh, really it's uh, I just uh, letting their universe and their reality to unfold for me yeah and it's it's funny and we're gonna kind of and I know we're gonna do this because we usually do this when we have conversations but go on tangents but one of the things I've I've often heard and, and try to prescribe is, you know, the things that you are, uh, when you're trying to take a break or reset, uh, to do things that are actually opposite of the way you would normally do things right. in work. So exactly. if you're analytical, yeah. do something that's not analytical, that's actually with your hands. Yeah. And that kind of lets you reset your brain. So it's interesting. Well, I just want to touch upon one of the things that helped me with, with meditation, uh, Cause I, I have a practice. Sometimes I miss it. I, I would say I have a morning practice and we can get into it if you have a more, but I don't have, uh, I don't have like a regular set meditation practice, which I think is, is something th that I probably 
need to revisit. But one of the things when I was meditating on a daily basis, realized was that it wasn't about trying to force your thoughts to go away. It was actually to actually look at your and observe your thoughts and let them pass kind of like a car. Right. And just observe almost like you're an observer, like a, like someone witnessing that thought. Because you are very analytical, how has how is how is how have you approached meditation in in terms of making it work for you? Um, over the years, I've come across con- concept of meditation many times and have tried it on and off, but in a very haphazard way a few times, and it uh, was not quite working for me. And then finally. Uh, uh, the final, uh, the last straw for me was I went to this conference uh, a bit under two years ago. It's called AFEST. And the topic of the conference was uh, mindfulness. And uh, when I went to this conference uh, and their, all their talks and lectures and workshops and the people, they were very different from the typical crowd I, I associate with, the typical conferences I go to. And I realized that how much uh, I spend my time in my head and thinking about stuff. And like, okay, so I do want to find a way to be more connected with my body, um, myself, if you will, and so on. And uh, so since then, I've been uh, meditating daily. And then it was still a journey. Like, you know, I uh, experimented with a number of approaches, like uh, counting meditation, then focusing on breathing, different things. And eventually... I found an approach uh, uh, that worked for me, what's called uh, noting, and uh, it's much more free-flowing approach, and that's what I've been doing, I guess, for the last maybe 12 months. What, what is it? What's noting? Um, it's kind of what you have described. It's really about observing. You just sit there and you let yourself observe what's happening, and you observe sensations coming to you through many different channels, sounds and uh, sensations in the body, feelings and emotions. Uh, uh, your eyes are closed, so you don't see that much, uh, your thoughts. But uh, the goal is to observe them and not to be consumed by them, just kind of look at them uh, from the side. And there are two ways of doing this. One is you actually look at this and you label it. You say, like, hmm, sound, hmm, uh, sensation of this and thought or you can just not even label that um you just uh, look at this and you make a note of this mentally and you move on to the next thing that's uh, where your attention is yeah it's like i said you know we don't want to get s- stuck on this because there's definitely a lot of ground i want to cover with you but i often find people just, you know, when I listen to or, or read different things about meditation and their struggles, th- people get too obsessed with doing it a certain way or doing it the right way. And ju- just to kind of close this loop, sometimes when I'm doing it, I don't even close my eyes. Mm-hmm. I just observe, like I look outside and I see the trees and I just watch them. So again, I, I, I think it's interesting, like, you know, you've tried different ways and you found one that fit. I feel like most people try just to make something work for them where they don't try or they, they, they feel like it's too hard. So I, I, like I said, not, not that there's, there's, there's a question here, but, but, uh, yeah, I just find it interesting when it comes to meditation, but it's something that I, I think is, kind of has has kind of brought some benefits definitely to my life. Now, just going back to the sabbatical. Yeah. Now, I know personally there are days where I find it harder. Like and when I meet harder kind of to not want to go into kind of work mode or looking at different things. How have you how's your experience been? Do you find it harder? Have you found it easier? What what have, what is what has your experience been thus far? Um, I did not find it hard at all. No, like uh, maybe it helped me that uh, 
some of the things that I've done early in my sabbatical that helped me to do a big reset of my brain. But uh, I'm not tempted at all uh, to grasp some business project. And uh, as I mentioned, like things come up and people come to me with uh, all kinds of projects and initiatives. And most of the time I look at them and I listen to myself like, no, they don't resonate with me for a number of reasons and I just move on. And sometimes I start engaging, but not really with a project so much, but with a person. Like if I sense that this is a person where I can uh, contribute to them and help them, you know, uh, expand their potential in relation not just to their to a particular project, but to their life, then I start spending more time with that person. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of come back. You mentioned, you know, from the retreat, you had this sense of what you wanted to kind of do. And I know, you know, the easy answer would be, you know, to really focus some time on blockchain, but, and, and you said that there's, there's things that come in to you and it's like, it doesn't fit. And, and we can assume that sometimes it might not fit with, kind of from a, a business point of view or just for for whatever reason. Is there anything that you can share about what that path looks like for you? Like I kind of explained the metaphor of like me wanting to go on adventures. Have you kind of been able to communicate it to others in a way or is it still kind of, are you still formulating it? Um, yeah, on my website, I try to formulate that and from time to time update this. So uh, if you go onto my website, uh, buterian.com, there is a bit of my current attempt of explaining yeah, that. And I, have, and I have updated that, uh, kind of where I am. In general, what I'm looking for is uh, uh, more and more it starts with the person. Because again, like I'm a big believer in, uh, if you will, a whole person that uh, they're success or the result of any project is a reflection of a personal team behind the project. So for me, it starts with like, is this a person that I want to be associated with and I want to spend time with? And, uh, and is this a person that, uh, how to put this, that, uh, is open to open up to his full potential, right? Is he open to growing, to facing, his own bullshit and then so on. So that's kind of starts with that. And then I look at the project like, okay, is it making sense? Like, is there really a concept that I understand? And most people, they have no clue. They come to you with a really complex thing and then talk. It's like, you know, that expression, solution looking for a problem. Yeah. The vast majority of ideas are like that. And they have no clue about the problem they're trying to solve. They use very complex language, right? And, uh, I'm a big believer that if you cannot explain your wonderful idea to a reasonably smart teenager, then your idea is not worth, you know, anything. Mm, so, you know, you don't really understand that yourself. So I look at their idea, I look at their business model, I look at their thinking about the plan, and then I look at whether the person is, uh, is open-minded, is open to evolve in his thinking about this, as well as uh, open to the concept that, uh, again, the project will be a reflection of of him and uh, his uh, collaborators and colleagues. Yeah, I like that approach, and it's funny. I, I like that. You know, if you can't if you can't communicate it to a smart teenager, I've 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 heard things similar, but I've never heard it th quite that way. It was so that's that's cool. I want to go back to the personal growth because I I feel like you know you and I. Every conversation we have usually touches upon that. And I'm also, I would say, very interested in personal growth. It's, it's something I've been interested in since I was 16. Where did that interest in personal growth come from? And kind of where did it start for you? Do, do you have kind of a, yeah. a moment? Um. My best recollection is uh, is I always been a bookworm. I loved reading. You know, when I was a kid, uh, we had uh, lots of books in our place, and uh, I learned to read when I was quite young. And I just started consuming books like crazy, and been doing that ever since. And uh, as I kept reading a lot of different books on uh, different topics, eventually I came across. Uh, 
again, I think I was maybe 25 at the time, maybe 22, somewhere in that range. I came across, uh, across uh, books by Tony Robbins. I think that was my first introduction to this whole space. Yeah. I read his uh, book, Unleash the I Giant Within, too. and something else. Um, and really then started exploring that space and found some other teachers and books and uh, audio books and uh, kind of went from there. So have you found that you've, over the years, gone back and reread specific books over and over again? Um, yes. And, you know, sometimes you get the same book. Well, not sometimes, always you get the same books. But if you read it a year later or a few years later, uh, you will have a totally different perspective on that. Like, for example, one book that I tried to read maybe 10, 12 years ago, it was uh, A Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And didn't make any fucking sense to me. Like, you know, what the hell is he talking about? I couldn't understand that book. It was like, to me, the time was total nonsense. And then I read that book a year ago. I'm like, oh my God, that resonated with me so much. It made total sense. Okay, so the book did not change, but I have changed. You know, I had the different other concepts to build on and I had other patterns in my brain, I guess. And then it really connected with me. Yeah, um, I've read a little bit of, Eckhart Tolle. And like I said, I think you have to be in the right moment to kind of <laughs> take, take him in, but it, but it is, uh, he, he it's really good stuff when, when you get into it. So one thing I've noticed just personally about you, but also, you know, obviously just looking at the stuff and the accomplishments and the projects and businesses you've been in and the way you kind of operate is you have this innate ability to be able to focus on yourself and improve yet at the same time, you know, again, coming from that technical or analytical background, you have this uncanny ability to focus on others and make them better and really focus on, like you said, really focus on the customer and solving their problems and not just coming up with a solution and looking for a problem that fits. How much of that is an innate skill versus an acquired skill? Mm -hmm. um, I think like from early on, because I was, uh, I had pretty high IQ, I think that, uh, Okay, I can understand things. But I also realized early on that uh, my passion is not just in understanding things, but then in turning around and helping other people around me understand those things. And um, also, this is for me is the best way to understand things because to be able to explain something, you really have to understand that yourself first, mm -hmm. like, you know, two or three levels better than the level that you want people to understand that, right? And that's been true, like, when I was in university, uh, freshman and whatever, and people have been telling me, though, I'm, you're really good at explaining this uh, stuff to me, like math and whatever else we're studying, mm -hmm. right? And then that continued as, uh, as I've been exploring other areas of uh, human knowledge, right, that were of interest to me. And then I was constantly finding, uh, looking for ways to, okay, how can I... Uh, help other people around me understand them things like uh, health and nutrition and exercise or spirituality or personal development or whatever else it is right or meditation right and, yeah and, and when you try to explain and uh, uh then you also realize the limitations of your own knowledge right and they're motivated to learn that better yeah yeah it's what the way i've kind of looked at it and maybe what you're saying as well is I've always felt it best to be a practitioner almost first before you are able to teach people. Yeah. Instead of teaching people from, from a perspective of you've kind of read something. So you've yeah. kind of done the work and you're able to kind of now help people knowing that you've done the work. Uh, which again is something I've seen from you, uh, just again in in your own life, and just how you, even like how you 
you know, you take care of, of your, your health and, and, and whatnot. But so here's an, here's a, another question. Has there, has there been any, over the last couple of years, has there been any new philosophies or habits where you kind of had an idea, you, you kind of had a, a, a way of thinking about it, but, but you've, you know, recently changed your mind about it. Totally. Many, many of them. And uh, I think that for me, that's one of the really important aspects of uh, uh, any human. We want to evolve. We want to keep growing, right? And if we don't do that, we get stuck and we end up being unhappy, right? Mm. And um, and you mentioned a few things like uh, one thing you, you talked about is habits. I'm a huge believer in habits. Uh, and I found over the years many ways to have this framework of different little habits that just keep me on track. And, you know, we always, uh, uh, stumble and all kinds of things come up in, uh, in your life, uh, and you get sick and this happens. But, uh, I found that, uh, my framework of different habits and they evolve, you know, doing where I am in my life, they are really helpful for me to, uh, get back, you know, on the, on track and uh, continue. And in terms of uh, philosophies, I'll give you a couple of examples. Like uh, I, for many years, I, I uh, a lot of my growth was coming from uh, self-study, mm-hmm. mostly reading books and then going to conferences and stuff. But for many years, I had uh, huge resistance to uh, working with coaches, mentors, and, and so on. And kind of once I was able to overcome that resistance and uh, and found some amazing people, like I mentioned, uh, Philip McCurran, there was other people who affected me uh, um, significantly, like a uh, business coach uh, by the name of Colin Collard, who lives in uh, Calgary, and some other people. Then that was a missing piece of the puzzle for me. Um, and um, also in the last maybe three, four years, as I've been on a quest uh, to um, develop my understanding and uh, immersion into spirituality. And that word for me for a long time was, uh, uh, if you will, a swear word. Uh, yeah. For me, it was uh, equated with religion, and I had a lot of resistance toward that. And uh, one book that really helped me change my thinking about that was a book called Waking Up by Sam Harris. I think I read it maybe five or six years ago. And when I'll put it that came in out. the show notes. Yeah. Uh, and that book, the subtitle of the book is something like uh, Spirituality Without the Religion, Without Religion. And, uh, and you know, that kind of started my spiritual journey, if you will. And I was like, oh, finally, I'm getting this. This is what people are talking about. And it's not about superstitions and all kinds of other bullshit, but it's something different. And uh, that really has become, if you will, my biggest quest now in terms of my personal growth and journey. Yeah, it's interesting because I've also, and I can't recall the the name of the book. I think it was um, Buddhism Plain and Simple or something like that. I'll, but I'll look, at, I'll look it up and put it in the show notes. But it explained Buddhism and spirituality in a, in a way that was so practical and none of this kind of, um, you know, religious pragmatic kind of uh dogmatic kind of uh interjections into it it was just very simple and and so i it was like i got it and then from there but one of the things that you said that i kind of want to touch upon because i've also had issue working with uh with other people i i find i do a lot of self-work like you i find that I, when I'm working with my team, I as well want to empower them and help them grow, but I'm very, I'm very resistant in some cases to working with people. And I think it kind of comes from that Tony Robbins era where you're like, is this person, is this person someone who's, who's a practitioner and who's done it instead of just someone who's turned themselves into a coach? How have how did you overcome that resistance with working with mentors, or and how did you select them? How did you decide right. to say, okay, I'm going to yeah. do this, and then select them? Yeah, and my personal uh, excuse uh, for my resistance uh, in that uh, 
uh, sphere was that, that I said to myself, oh, you know what? Most of them, all of them are full of shit. And yeah. most of them are. But their flip side of this was actually when you find very few, you know, 1% of people who are not, then they are worth their weight in gold. And uh, uh, I think that one thing that helped me, again, like I started with uh, self-study and reading books and whatnot, and then 13 years ago, well, now a bit more than that, uh, I joined this organization called EO, Entrepreneurs Organization, and uh, that's been a tremendous tool that helped me grow. And one thing that that organization does, they put people into the small groups, they call them forums, uh, kind of a mastermind group that meet on a monthly basis. And then they give you a certain framework and they train you to help you, uh, to help the group, you know, really connect on a deep level. And then the group becomes, uh, that becomes your uh, peer group. And then you coach and mentor each other. So that's my first step when I saw the benefits of, uh, other people helping me uh, uh, understand myself, giving me uh, feedback and input and whatnot. And then through that setup, also, I got into uh, experimenting with different uh, business coaches and uh, similar kind of people. And, uh, and then I found uh, a handful that uh, uh, made a huge impact on me. And I, yeah, so then I finally accepted the fact that, yes, in this industry, there's a lot of hot air, a lot of people who don't really know what they're talking about, but they're also amazing people that can make a huge impact on you. No, absolutely. Like I said, it's something I personally still want to revisit because I feel like it's it's a weakness in me. Uh, and just hearing you talk about it, it makes me want to double down. And, you know, while uh, I'm still on this kind of journey and transition, uh, something that I'm, I'm going to make an effort into actually getting into into my life and you know let, let me also mention this like one of their one big realizations uh, for me in the last few years has been that whenever we look at people and we have resistance or judgment uh i found it's very useful and important then turn it around and see like oh what am i resistant judging in myself right like for example i can look at the person who is uh, overweight and i can judge them and when i turn this around i look at myself like oh okay so why the hell is it so important for me to not be overweight and be you know fit and all of that stuff and then then i realized oh yeah you know what it's because i'm judging the hell out of myself and i'm thinking that if uh, i'm not uh, you know in a perfect shape and form or whatever then people will not like me people will not love me you know and really it's fear it's like my desire for love and approval and appreciation all of that stuff and once i see that and then i'm like you know what i want that they want this like i see myself and every person that i judge and the same thing like going back to coaching is like okay so why do i have this resistance right uh to um coaches and whatnot and uh, i think that it really was there that when i look at them and some of them i judge them that they have achieved some success even though they are not really uh, delivering much of much value, if you will. Right. And then I realized it's probably when I turn this around, it's really because of my envy and because of uh, I'm thinking that, oh, you know, I deserve more than I have, right? Like how come that they have this recognition and whatnot and I don't, right? I should be better than them. And this is really the ego thing, which uh, compares yourself and feels inferior and, once I was able to see that, like, okay, it was much easier for me to stop judging that and kind of see the reality for it is versus like those filters. Yeah. And as you're talking, one of the things I've, I've heard and kind of questioned too is when you resist or, or judge somebody for some behavior or characteristic, usually it's a thing you hate in yourself. Always. Always, no exception. Yeah, and so that's... Sometimes been... it's hitting, right, from yourself, but it's always the case. Yeah. And the question is then, like, and you can use every judgment as an opportunity to grow and uh, accept yourself. Because once you're able to accept yourself, then you're able to do so much more for this world, for people around you. Absolutely. Now, we've talked a little bit about fear, but what I wanted to talk to you about... Uh, 
or ask you the question about is failure and kind of your relationship with it. Because obviously, you know, growing personally, being in business, being, you know, building a, a successful business, uh, more than, more than one, three, you know, how has failure or an apparent failure kind of set you up for a future success? Uh, and, and do you have a favorite failure? Um, yeah. One thing I, I have to say that, uh, one way to look at failure is that, okay, if something is not working, then uh, it means that you have not yet invested enough time to make it work. Yeah. Right? So that's kind of my strong as well as weak side is I'm very persistent um, because you start doing something and uh, it's not necessarily going to become this huge success that you thought it will be. But again, as long as you persist, as long as you keep learning and then you evolve from that, then that becomes something else. And uh, for example, before Wild Apricot, which was a software company, the business uh, was called Bonus Source. That was a service agency, right? And uh, we never really made it a very successful service agency because it was, uh, I was still uh, not a very mature entrepreneur and I was struggling to scale it and uh, find a way to have a consistent uh, sales process and all of that stuff, right? So. Uh, their service uh, business, it, um, if you will, it was a failure. However, from that uh, came out Wild Apricot because uh, pretty much every service agency out there, they want to become a product-based company, or at least many of them. And uh, we had the desire and we had a few attempts and we failed. And eventually we made a decision and we succeeded with uh, Wild Apricot as a product. So that was for me like, of evolution and uh, we can say that uh, the company did okay the service company bonus sure. source but then as a product company we've done so much better and uh, now as i'm looking at the company moving forward it's doing better and better and it's really successful as a product company yeah and just one you know we don't have to kind of go down a rabbit hole but one question I don't think I've ever asked you is because obviously we met at Toastmasters in the early 2000s and that's that was yeah. a membership. Did Wild Apricot, did the idea or was was part of the catalyst being in Toastmasters and working? I was curious. I, yeah, I I actually ever... at the time, right? So I moved to uh, Toronto end of 99 and uh, was building my uh, life and career here. And uh, one of the things I was doing is uh, trying to get involved and really with their community and learn the ropes and understand how their world works here, right? Versus where I grew up and lived and worked at, in Soviet Union in Moscow. Um, and uh, I got involved with a number of organizations. Toastmasters was one, then AIMS, uh, uh, Association for Internet Marketing and Sales. Yeah. There was another organization called TVG. So I got involved in a number of uh, nonprofit kind of community organizations. And yes, when I saw and I was trying to help them and I was so how dismal their technological infrastructure was. And like, you know what? Like a uh, tech guy in me said, yeah, this can be automated. This can be made better. Yeah. And obviously you saw the problem. Um, and I mean, it's... And that Toastmasters Club, right? We actually uh, pro bono made the uh, custom website for them a long time ago and that actually made them from what i've heard uh, one of the most successful clubs in the city because they had a decent website they had a schedule of events they had a bunch of other things that no other clubs had and they've been doing well ever since yeah and actually i remember hear hearing that that's uh that's going down memory lane so what i kind of want to switch gears and talk a little bit about parenting because Obviously, you're the proud father of three. Yep. Uh, one being Vitalik, mm -hmm. who's the creator of Ethereum. So the second you know, largest cryptocurrency in the world, according to, to market cap and just general yep. ecosystem. So my question is, because this is something I know that you have, you know, deliberate way of thinking about business and life. Have you and your wife thought about uh, how do you guys approach parenting because this is something my wife and i always talk about in terms of our approach is uh because obviously 
you know, I know that the two younger children are, are still young, but Vitalik obviously at a young age has been able to achieve a lot is I'm just curious to kind of deep dive as much as you feel comfortable, your approaches on, on parenting. Yeah. Um, my thinking about parenting obviously has been evolving for a long time. And uh, I've become a father when I was uh, 21, so 25 years ago. And a um, few things like, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm very libertarian in my thinking. And for me, that extends to uh, my attitude towards parenting. And that means that uh, it's a freedom of choice, right? I don't... Th- think that as a parent I have the right to impose my will and desire on my children and you know I do have my responsibility toward them to help them grow in a safe uh, environment and all of that stuff but uh, really and especially as Vitalik was growing uh, uh, he's a very smart uh, person right so um, I was uh, doing my best not to impose my opinions on him because very often you know when you talk to a child and uh, they ask you but why why are they so why should they go to bed why and this and that and uh, it's very tempting to say because I said so right and Mm -hmm. really it means I have no fucking clue right (laughs) Uh, and that was never a satisfactory answer to me so I always tried and I cannot say that I always succeeded but okay why do I want this why am I insisting on things being this way and let's have a dialogue with, uh, about this with a child. And I think this is also what children want because otherwise they, uh, uh, I think this whole teenage rebellion thing is really there. They grow up and they realize that they've been told a lot of things and a lot of those things, they're really just uh, programming. Their parents have no clue how they got that programming. And now, you know, they have become young adults. And you're passing it on to them. Yeah, and they're like, oh, you know, my parents actually have no clue and they've just been telling me, all those things, but they're tales and lies and misconceptions, right? And uh, that's a source of conflict. Uh, so for me, really uh, having that dialogue and uh, uh, also looking at uh, children not in a condescending way, but if you will, in some ways they're your equals, you know, they're fellow consciousness. And yes, you have all kinds of responsibilities toward them to keep them safe and support them. But uh, that's on you, right? You don't have, if you will, this ownership of them. So that's, uh, and one final point is, uh, you know, when Vitalik was growing up and uh, he was a unique boy, obviously very smart and many different things. And he had a lot of an anxiety about, uh, you know, how he will be able to communicate with kids in the class and this and that. And, you know, will it be easy for him to socialize? And um, at some point I was just able to, turn this around uh, well I'll switch this and uh, and just accept you know this is the, the way things are and as long as I can give him my love and acceptance he'll be okay you're just gonna believe that and um, that so at some point an anxiety just went away and mm-hmm. and that's and it's uh, uh, tried if you will but I think that uh, their main thing that any parent can give to their kids is their love and acceptance for them the way they are and not worry too much about trying to shape them. Because you know what? It's an illusion that you think that you can really shape them to be a certain way. Yeah, you can affect them in some way, but the genetics, all the things in the environment, all the books, the friends, the school, there are so many influences, right? So don't worry about trying to influence them. Uh, and also, it never works you trying to tell them what to do. They will model your behavior, but they will not listen to your bullshit, right? Because if you tell them one thing, but you're doing another, they will just follow actual example of what you're doing, but not, you know, what you're trying to tell them what to do. Yeah. And and with my kids, my, you know, I I got married uh, and she had two children and they're 18 and and twins. And one uh, is in University of of, uh, Waterloo. Uh, and very, very academic, uh, very smart in for, from a from a book smart. And the other, uh, my daughter, she, her her EQ is is very high, I believe. And she actually went to uh, to Ryerson and decided it wasn't for her. And it's interesting. We were okay with that. We kind of had a conversation. And she's 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 doing. She's 
she's doing things now that are more entrepreneurial. And it's, it's funny. I'll just tell you a quick story. One of the classes she was in fashion and communications. And one of the classes she had issue with was the, the design course, because it was very mathematical. Uh, and it was, it was, it was for, it was really tailored for the designers, not the people who are kind of on the designer communication side. And so that was fine. Long story short, she comes home, she starts, uh, taking vintage clothes and repurposing and sewing it together with an old sewing machine that we, we kind of, we got for her that was kind of in the basement for years. So she's now sewing, designing, redesigning and, and, and sewing and, and, and selling online, like all over the place. Like one we just sent off to Australia, I feel like the last couple of months. So I said to my wife, it's interesting how her biggest, one of her biggest issues was this sewing and design class in university, but yet she comes home and she basically is able to figure it out. And she was never really into sewing as a kid, but she's into fashion. And, so, and it was just like, she figured out a way to do it for herself and now she's learning it. Right. So I often find that it's, it's sometimes it's, you know, and again, if, if that particular course and administrator realized that we're teaching it for a certain type of student, the designer, the person who's actually going to be a professional designer versus someone who just wants to have a knowledge of it, that might have been one less thing she would have been concerned about. So it's almost like in some cases, it's the way we're the educational system is kind of letting us down. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole, but yeah. but it's interesting because I know that I guess my point being is with Vitalik, you know, he, obviously he left school and, uh, you know, I'm sure you gave him some good advice as well. I mean, he went into the, the Teal, the Teal Fellowship, which is a pretty prestigious uh, program uh, for, for young entrepreneurs and, and bright minds uh, kind of led by Peter Thiel. And I'll, I'll put all that in the show notes. Um, but I guess what advice would you give kind of a younger person who's about to go into the real world uh, and, and specifically what advice should they ignore? Um, the biggest piece of advice I would say is to actually go out and try stuff, right? Because uh, I'm a big believer in learning all of your life, you know, lifelong learning. But end of the day, be the best way of learning is to do stuff, right? And that's kind of what worked for me when I look at Vitalik, how he developed his career as he started just... Uh, and, uh, you know, volunteering is an awesome way to start your career, right? Because when you're young, you don't have much in the way of skills and knowledge but you know what if you have good attitudes and you can find a way to volunteer you can find a way to help some other people and in this way then you can get involved you can contribute and uh, who knows what kind of new avenues will open up for you right so i think this is really the best way to to grow and develop is uh by actively seeking ways to do something practical and learn from that no absolutely so i i want to kind of switch gears into uh, kind of business and and leadership. Now, obviously, you you had three businesses. Uh, you know, I believe, or at least three of them were uh, reached seven figures, right? And one obviously reached eight, which was wild wild apricot. But like again, seeing you know and, and knowing in knowing you, you've obviously done things differently, which I've always. I've always found fascinating. Again, you come from that technical background, but you seem to have focused on the softer side of business, like you know, culture, values, empowering others to be right. more self-managed, more autonomous. Yeah. Which obviously I think has been a big part of your your success. And and it's also been effective, right? I yeah. mean, like you said, Wild Avocat, I think I, I read in, a, in an article when, when you when you were uh, when you were exiting, that it actually grew twenty percent per year with a sales team of zero, right? Uh, and it, you know, at the point I think it was at 10, 10 million revenue. That's mm -hmm. what that was. What was yep. publicized? And as a marketer, that's really fascinating. And I'll have to <laughs> talk to 
to you or, or somebody who was on your marketing team about that. Cause to me that, that, that was something that just kind of, I focused in on, but do you think focusing on the softer side of business has made you a better leader? The way I think about this is that, uh, if you look, if you will, at uh, old school organizational structures, they are very hierarchical. And the concept is that there is this uh, awesome, extremely smart guy who is the CEO. Then, you know, there is his leadership team and, you know, he directs his leadership team. Then they direct, you know, the next layer, uh, level down. And then there's a bunch of minions who actually do stuff. But, you know, maybe that worked in the industrial era, but it's no longer applicable, right? Because for any successful business these days, you have to have so many bright minds doing so many different things. And uh, for any smart person, you know what? If you're any good at what you do, you can find any kind of job out there, right? So you will not want to work in an organization where they just basically tell you what to do. I've been firmly convinced of that for many years is that the best way to really leverage uh, or capabilities of any person is to have them as fully engaged in the organization as possible, right? So that means uh, they should be able to provide the input and uh, direction and be, uh, um, if you will, uh, self-directed uh, as much as possible in what they do. So that's been the foundation of my philosophy about business and uh, uh, implicitly and also in the last five years as I've been learning more and more about organizational theory and then i read this wonderful book called reinventing organizations uh, by frederick yeah, lalu i've that, got into it that made a big impact on me and then we w went through this restructuring that wild apricot when we uh made the organization even more self-reliant and kind of much less of a hi hierarchy but more of uh if you will this uh, consortium of uh, self-directed groups and it takes time and effort but really it's still the best way to bring out the best and people and uh, leverage all the different talents and uh, motivations that people have. Yeah, again, I'll put it in the show notes, but just I'm going to read a bit of text uh, that you have on your site. And, and you said that uh, successful businesses of the future will be built on new organizational models, which will help everyone in the organization be at their best. And then you'd you go on to say that one of the models you'd like is teal. Again, I'll put, I'll put all that in the show notes and you implemented it. And you said, you finished by saying it was hard to do, but very rewarding. So how did you, like, what is, I don't know how long we can get into this, but how, you know, what is the teal model? Uh, cause I've just got into the book and how did you kind of first discover it? And what were some of the challenges? Because what was interesting is that you sold the business and you transitioned fairly quickly out. And I actually listened to a podcast with Shiv, on, uh, who is the CMO or the, the yeah. and he had said that it was a very, you know, quick. You had done the work like two years prior, but it was a very quick transition and it was very efficient because of the way you brought up the leaders and you kind of had made things more effective and uh you know in implementing this model but but can you kind of talk to me about you know what teal was and kind of you know. yeah um again one way to think about this is uh it's not a hierarchy but it's think about this it's somewhat similar to uh holacracy holacracy is another organization structure that uh, some organizations uh, have been experimenting with, including Zappos. And uh, holacracy, uh, uh, they talk about uh, different circles instead of hierarchy, but it's like uh, each circle is a group of people, they doing whatever they do, and then they have interfaces, they interact with other groups in the organization. And uh, the concept is that instead of me, the CEO, developing this wonderful vision and strategy, the strategy evolves uh, from uh, many different groups knowing what's the best in their particular sphere of influence. You know, if customer support group doing customer support, then they really have wealth of knowledge of what customers are calling about, what they're asking about, what their concerns are. How do we actually source that knowledge and then have them feed that into the mix of all other information flows in the organization, right? And then you have development group who care about coding and then they plugged in into the modern trends of software development and then this is another information flow and then based on all of that stuff then how do you 
look at all of this and how do different groups interact and how do you find alignment, right? Otherwise, they all go into different directions. So yeah, I mean, till can be a topic for a whole another podcast, but again, it's a, a think about this as a self-organizing collection of uh, individual groups, which each one has a certain area of responsibility and focus, and then there is a, they operate within the overall framework of organizational uh, purpose and uh, core values and, and, and such. Yeah, and it's interesting because while you're talking, I, I, um, the thing that comes to mind, I think Elon Musk had talked, talks about it. I think Peter Thiel talks about it. I think, uh, the, the founders of Netflix talk about it. It's that first principle thinking. Now, there, there is processes, but it's, it's to create the processes, but to have people that not only are empowered to, to kind of do the right thing. But also, their first principle thinkers, they just don't follow process for the sake of following process. Right. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. Again, it's, it's in a way, it's just having the yeah. right people. And, you know, I'm a big believer in processes, you know, since my early in my career when I worked as a consultant for big organization doing kind of uh, process consulting and re engineering and stuff like that. But I've come to realize that uh, processes get broken and, uh, you know, culture always uh, trumps process, right? And, you know, good people can fix a broken process, but, you know, broken process will will not work even if you have the best people, right? But if you try to feed them into this uh, uh, limited, uh, messed up process, then the outcome will not be what you want. No, absolutely. So I guess... One of the things I did, did want to touch upon, and I know we could, there's a lot of different ways to answer this, but because I guess the question is, you know, in your mind, what is, what makes good culture? Um, in my experience, uh, culture, how to put this? One guy, what's his name? Uh, Patrick Lincioni. He's got. Uh, he's a famous business writer, and uh, he made a big impact on my thinking about many different things, including uh, uh, culture. And I trying to recall a particular book, but I read a bunch of his books. And one thing he talks about that there are different kind of uh, values, and uh, some of them uh, he calls aspirational. And many organizations then they talk about. Uh, Oh, we want to be this, we want to be that. But the question, are you that way? And why are why are you that way? And uh, I think that organization starts from uh, one or more founders. And those people, they bring their personal biases and the specific perspectives into the business. And those eventually become implicitly established core values of the organization, right? Whether it's there has been explicit process or implicit process for that, but that's how it's, it starts. And... Uh, for me, it's important to realize that and uh, acknowledge what it is. And uh, and if you want to shift the organizational culture, it's, uh, it's a complex process. Like I've seen people try to go through this uh, exercise when they get a bunch of smart people into the room. They brainstorm some nice sounding core values. They put up them. They come up with this list and they have this nice poster. They put it on the walls in the organization. They think they're done. Well, that's just a start, right? Because... Uh, then you have to figure out how do you actually leave those core values in your day-to-day -day operations, right? Do you have every person in organization starting from the leadership to actually uh, live and behave according to those core values? Is that the case, right? Do you hire people based on that? Do you fire people when there is a mismatch and, you know, they might be a wonderful uh, task performer, but what if they, their core values are mismatched with the organization? Are you willing to let somebody go because of that, right? So a lot of hard questions and uh, a lot of work has to be put into actually making their core values their actual core values and not just a proclamation of what you want your business to be. Yeah, and, and more make it like a, a living document. Again, yeah. I, I look at, and I know you've done something similar with Netflix. They actually have, uh, I think it's it was it's a... It, it, one format is a PDF. It could just be a yeah. PDF, and they continually build off that and 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 and, exactly. and stress yeah. test it. They document actually has been a big inspiration when they're working on our stuff some many years ago. They have okay. this uh, document that they share in public, like a huge presentation yeah. of their core values, and it's been very inspiring. And uh, yeah, we've used that. Very cool. So, 
what I want to do is kind of bring it into in the present day again. And again, we've we've talked a lot about you know being uh, you know about the sabbatical. And I know that right now, again, you're you're not looking, but you're you, you know you're you're open to to helping uh, you know tech entrepreneurs. Uh, and again, on you know, on your site, you say to create and scale, you know, quote unquote, blockchain businesses. And I think you're you're just working with the team at, at Block Geeks with Amir Ros- yeah. Rosic. Yeah, okay. I was involved as we were getting the story, kind of more hands on stuff. Yeah. But, uh, the last twelve month, he's been running the show, and I'm just an investor and advisor. Yeah, and they they look like they're doing really really cool stuff just from the transformation of their website and and yeah. just things that they're doing uh i'll i'll put that uh into the show notes is do you do you want to explain block geeks uh it's pretty simple it's basically uh i'm a big believer that the blockchain movement is uh is a new paradigm that's really helping us also build a better society if you will like uh in the uh, internet help us to remove many layers of you know of intermediaries and i think that blockchain is the the next step in that movement as we're able to again create uh, create more transparency more connect more direct connection between uh, consumers and producers and all of that stuff and um and that movement is uh, it needs many more people to work on uh, on all of those technologies and projects and uh, there is a dearth of uh uh, development resources. So the mission of Blog Geeks is to help uh, educate many more developers, so they they can uh, then get involved and in, uh, in startups and projects and initiatives, uh, blockchain based ones. And the the way we do it is uh, uh, content marketing. I'm a big believer in that. We create a lot of uh, free, high quality content explaining blockchain, what is Ethereum, what is EOS, what is talking, what is this and that. So we create a lot of free content. And then for people who really want to go deeper, then we offer online training and sell their subscription to online training. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, because I guess the backstory here is uh, about maybe a, a year and a half ago, uh, I, kind of got into blockchain and just, I was in, I, I'm always looking at new technologies and just, and so as a result, I've had conversations with my wife, who's obviously not really uh, tech savvy at that level or, or other people who don't know a lot about it. How do you explain it to say the layman? Like how, when you, do you ever get into conversations where, you're, you're trying to explain it to somebody and how would you explain it just to the average average person i've done this many times and i do this quite a bit uh and uh i usually start by explaining bitcoin right and because yeah. then blockchain is really their foundational technology in uh, on which bitcoin works and it's just a, a generalization of uh, uh technology that's uh in the foundation of Bitcoin, but then apply to many more things than money. So, and again, like that can be a whole another podcast conversation, but uh, uh, Bitcoin is a digital money without a central authority to support that. And then it's a way to store records of uh, who owns what in terms of uh digital money, right? But now then people realize that the same approach can be used for records of anything else, like your you know, insurance and health and uh, identity and other stuff and found some uh, amazing new possibilities because when you remove that uh, point of centralization, you remove so much overhead and also you remove a lot of security risk, right? Because uh, uh, every day you read about this, oh, you know, this website got hacked and then all the information they got on you got stolen like every day, right? You read about this stuff. And again, with blockchain, you can approach this from a totally different perspective like uh when they don't have to you 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 keep the ownership of all of your information just like in bitcoin's case there's no bank you have full ownership of your digital money and that means that you if you lose your password to you 
Bitcoin wallet, then the money is gone. Nobody yeah. can recover that for you. And in the same way, like, you know, you have full ownership of your digital identity of your health records and so on. So the blockchain kind of, that's the promise. And again, I'm just, I'm not giving it justice. I'm just kind of uh, giving you a glimpse of what it is, but that deserves a whole another big conversation. Yeah. And just before we kind of move on to, to uh, kind of close up, I, I feel there's, uh, I feel the kind of evolution of this technology, very exciting. I think you and I share, uh, because I, I've watched a couple interviews where you are specifically talking about it. And right now it's really about the plumbing. It's really about just kind of infrastructure. And right. from a marketer, I'm kind of sitting back because I realize it's it's not quite ready for people to use the the average yeah. person so that the ui the ux you know the kind of the storytelling the branding the everything that comes with that afterwards it's it's really too early so i'm just kind of following it as a advocate and as a fan yeah and waiting to see you know as as kind of the next generation of SaaS come out where they actually can build adoption uh then then i you know i'm i'm yeah. i'm in, i'm someone who want to at least feel like that's when i could get involved so i guess kind of in the in the vein of entrepreneurship what are some bad recommendations you've heard uh others give tech entrepreneurs you know one thing maybe i'll mention about uh, advice or whatever sometimes when people build businesses they become over focused on the goal the bright future and then they underestimate uh, what they end up sacrificing for that the personal lives they own of their employees and uh, all kinds of collateral damage and i just don't believe that that works and uh, sometimes like growing a business it's uh, like growing a tree you put mm -hmm. a seed then you you water that you put the nutrients but you know what? Then it has its own speed of growth. And you can dance around that and uh, all kind of crazy shaman dances and whatnot. But it will not grow any faster. It will grow at its uh, intrinsic speed. And people, they want, oh, I want this to grow faster. And the really good question, like, why? Right? What's driving that? What's behind this? What is your fear? And, uh, and what are you willing to do because of that fear? Right? And those sacrifices and decisions that you... Uh, making uh, other really what are the long term consequences of the consequence of that? So that's kind of my philosophy toward business and uh, uh, just uh, thinking through all of those uh, uh, comprehensive uh, outcomes of your decisions uh, on your life, on your employees' lives, and uh, on the environment, on so many things around you. Yeah, and you're not just saying that you because you know as an example, you've never. You never took outside investment for as far as I, I know. Um, right. And, and, uh, and oh. so that's usually the you know reason is you, you see a lot of these startups, they, they take money and, and they've got to grow at, a, at some ridiculous rate because only, you know, the reality is in seven years, they ha the, the investors have to pay out their limited partners in the fund. Yeah. So they, they have to get to a certain point year after year, you know, in seven years. So like you said, uh, I think you and uh, Jason Freed and DHH of uh, Basecamp or 37 share very similar. I think so. I was really inspired by their thinking, their books, and, you know, like that really resonated with my own thinking and philosophies when I was reading this stuff. Yeah. And also because uh, I've been all of my life, I've been in tech business, right, and software development. And in that space, again, it's uh, if you trying to grow too fast, you end up doing all kinds of shortcuts, right? And uh, and those shortcuts, uh, actually, many of them, they are uh, counterproductive to long-term success of your business because when you burn uh, people, uh, like you make them work overtime and do stuff, like great software engineers, if they work instead of normal hours, you know, they work overtime, they will not deliver much more. They actually probably will deliver less than uh, they do in this during, during normal time, during normal hours. Uh, and also things like uh, security, 
which is a big deal. Like, you know, that's why we're looking at all those big hacks and those stupid big companies uh, losing gobs of data because they were driven to, you know, issue this product, you know, deliver on a certain timeline, and then they forget about uh, things like security and, and whatnot. No, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, I think that's, be honest with you, good advice for any any of the other entrepreneurs out there listening. Uh, where's the best place to kind of see your body of work or to see what you're up to uh, right now? Um, I would say start with my personal website, buterian.com, and then I there's a link there to my Twitter and LinkedIn accounts, and I kind of try to share some of my thinking and progress through those channels. Okay. All right, we'll put that again in the show notes. Well, Dimitri, it was great seeing you again, uh, as always. Uh, thanks so much for doing this. Thanks so much for setting it up uh, at uh, Wild Apricot. Um, yeah, it's, thanks, been, it's been great. Really man. good talking to you. All right, cheers. Well, that's it for this session. For those of you who made it this far, Thank you so much. Quick reminder, the show notes will be available on my website at mitchellfanning.com. And at this stage of the game, I really only have two small requests. Number one, I'd really love to get your feedback. And you can do that by either going to iTunes and leaving a review or contacting me via email or social. Just use the hashtag MitchCast. Again, all of this can be found on my website. Because like I said before, it's really going to be your feedback that's going to give me the oxygen to keep me going in the early stages and to improve the show. Because ultimately, I want this to be something that you'll also get value from. Last but not least, if you know somebody who might be interested in being a guest on the show, please reach out and let me know as well. That's it. That's all. Until next time, thank you so much.